Namaste. Namaste. <clears throat> so when uh, <clears throat> Natalia's mother was, how old would she have been? It would have been like 2004, 15, 16, maybe before that. She would uh, come to church wearing flip-flops. And um, it was the, and something about how she walked in, and maybe it's because her feet are the size of small canoes. <laughs> um, when she would, she would walk up to read, and it what seemed like this thunderous clap from that flip flop slapping back up against her foot. <laughs> I don't know what made me think of that. She wonder. Something, but I used to call her Slappy. <laughs> um, so anyway, mysticism <laughs> comes up again and again, and I really think. Uh, that, it, that it's important, well, no, let me say it differently. I have an agenda, surprisingly. I have a, an agenda through Lent of presenting a, a vision of spirituality that actually includes both hemispheres of the brain. And to be able to do that, we're going to need to reject nipples to knees theology that says the only thing that really matters happens between our nipples and our knees. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, okay. <laughs> I'm going to hear about that later. But <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's such a reductionistic view. And with it comes this idea that we've talked about over the last several weeks that we start out at a disadvantage and are always trying to claw our way back up to barely acceptable if we're lucky. And <coughs> it really is a notion that's completely foreign to the Jewish people and the Old Testament. Um, there is no notion of original sin, and I'm going to talk about that more next week, so I don't want to get into that too much, but there is no notion of original sin anywhere in the Bible, and yet because St. Augustine had this problem where whenever was a woman was around, his pants fell down. <laughs> or maybe it was that his robe flew up, you know, depending on how he was dressed. Um, and he needed a way to explain that to himself, so he said, I know, original sin. Um, but in fairness to Augustine, he was ordained against his will, and anybody who goes through that ought to probably deserves a little slack. And he had a lot, a lot of other ideas that were actually pretty decent. But... Unfortunately, that one is kind of stuck. And, and I think, I don't want to sound too cynical, but I think it's stuck because it's much easier to control people who you can make feel guilty. And if you can make them feel guilty for stuff that is absolutely normal, that's even better yet. It's much more effective. And so hence came this notion, especially in, in fundamentalist circles, that if, it's, if it feels good, it must be a sin. <laughs> Which somebody at my first church told me this joke, and I don't know that it's real funny, but it, it, I think it's real informative anyway. The guy goes to his priest and he says, you know that feeling you get when you take a Q-tip and you put it in your ear and you, you hit just the right spot? The priest says, yeah. He says, well, is that a sin? And the priest says, no. And the guy said, well, thank God, because I've gone through five of those giant boxes this week. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that assumption. Don't enjoy yourself too much. Because if you enjoy yourself too much, something must be wrong. Are you relaxing over there? Because if you're relaxing over there, you must be pretty full of yourself to think that you deserve to relax. Or the Pentecostal church that I was in. If you're not thinking about Jesus every 15 minutes, you better get down on your knees and pray. If you're not thinking about Jesus, or no, if you are thinking about Jesus every 15 minutes, you might be psychotic. That's <laughs> <laughs> Unless you've got a timer or something. And, and so, mysticism is part of getting the right brain into our spirituality. And for myself, I kind of go back and forth, because there are a lot of stories in scriptures that never happened, but most of them are true. Um, 
She agrees. It's okay. It's okay. I, I agree with him. <laughs> it's my theological censor. Um, <laughs> and, and yet, you know, if you get too wrapped up in trying to decide that the only part you want to pay attention to is the stuff that absolutely did happen that way, that's kind of an exercise in distraction as well. And so this story of the transfiguration, um, laden as it is with symbolism that absolutely escapes us today, um, such as Peter's, you know, Peter bungles in just about all the parables and stories, but Peter's bungle that says, where he says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, we'll make three dwellings here. And we say to ourselves, why would he want to live on the side of the mountain? But it was during the, they think this happened during the Jewish festival of tabernacles. So you did make dwellings. That was part of the deal. And, and let's suppose for just a minute that you're a person who has dreams and remembers them, which I guess we all dream. Some of us have a harder time remembering. Sometimes those dreams are kind of a putting together of pieces of our lives that, that are being sorted out. And they can even be insightful. Now, they can be pretty bizarre as well. But there's, in fact, when I was a kid, I was afraid to go in the basement for months because I had a dream about Barnabas Collins from, <laughs> what was that song called? Dark, Dark Shadows. Shadows. Dark Shadows, yeah. <laughs> Barnabas Collins was in the basement and was going to, you know, vampire me if I went down there. So all it took was one Barnabas Collins dream. But other dreams aren't quite like that. And, you know, if, if the transfiguration is really about it kind of clicking together as to who this Jesus was, and if we understand that in Jewish thought, it's about law and prophets. Moses brought the law. Elijah is the principal prophet. And so all of a sudden, to a Jewish mind, you see Moses, you see Elijah, you see Jesus. You're going, ah, there's some kind of continuity here. And then next thing you know, the only one standing there is Jesus. What You might come to the conclusion that, OK, this guy is OK. He actually is connected to the to the prophets we're used to, to the law that we value so much. And he's not some kind of a renegade. And it doesn't really matter, I don't think, whether the story really happened or whether somebody wrote it that way to describe a realization that they were having. Because, and this is going to seem like a leap, but doesn't poetry convey truth in a way that prose cannot? And doesn't a painting convey truth in a way that neither poetry nor prose can? And we come to this stuff so often and we want to be left trained about it. We want the newspaper, you know, we, we want the uh, Newsweek version or Time Magazine version of, of the Bible. And yet what we're talking about are these experiences that we all have. So if we want to talk about experience, and we want to get our right brain involved, we're going to have to come to the conclusion that Kimberlin can't possibly be the only tree-hugging hippie that we have in the room. <laughs> because Kimberlin talks about experiencing God when she hugs trees, or touches them or something, yeah. feels them. What are you doing with trees? Yeah, I don't know. It's best that it's, you know, if Kimberlin it's, it's touches a tree in the woods and nobody's there to hear it. <laughs> or the person who, you know, the bane of many churches years ago was, that, what do you mean you're golfing on Sunday morning? Whoa. But you know, golfing on Sunday morning puts you out in nature, unless you're miniature golfing on Sunday morning. <laughs> golfing can be a way to, to um, commune with the transcendent. If we stop focusing on things we believe we shouldn't be doing because they feel good, we might actually start exploring things that increase our spirituality because, well, we've never tried them before. We might go for that walk in the woods. We might find that trail. We might, why, I don't know, but we might go for a polar plunge. <laughs> we might go on that trip we've never gone on before. 
you know, book that cruise. I have a great joke about that, I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, but there's a freedom in that, and there's a celebration in that, of saying that, you know, what if creation is good? What if we were even made complete with the ability to make mistakes? And that's how people learn, so that's good. What if the only thing that isn't really good is something that takes life away from somebody else, either literally or metaphorically? So, you know, keeping your kid, kids in a dog kennel is probably life tonight. But let's face it, well, for more than like six or eight hours. Exactly. But let's face it, there's not a whole lot of people that do that. We keep it hidden. I'm sorry. That's right. In the garage. Yeah. What if we might come to recognize that we're going to have to intentionally expose ourselves to creativity if we're going to expand our own spiritual side? And if, if like me for many years, you don't believe you're creative, then I would say your definition of creative is too narrow. You know, you don't have to be able to make a sculpture or paint with oil or any particular thing to be creative. You think starting a church might count? No. I think baking a cake also counts. Baking a cake counts. <laughs> Cooking a nice meal. <coughs> um, writing counts. Writing is art. Um, all the art that's done isn't done with you know, finger paints and things like that. So, so what are the ways that we're creative? How can we acknowledge to ourselves that we, we have a way of doing things, even problem solving, that's kind of unique to us? So, so what are you good at? And don't be modest. Oh, just about everything in my mind. <laughs> just saying. Well, even if it's hand. bad, i got to find the good in it. That's right. Don't be, don't be modest. Maybe I should have couched that differently. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, if I pressed you to say, tell me one creative thing you do, what would it be? Take my dog in the woods. And touch trees. And watch her enjoy mm -hmm. the nature. You sing. I thought you said you think. I was going to say, well. That's true. Singing. Singing. Making music. Mm -hmm. I like to make up music as it goes along, as I go along. <laughs> she likes you to know, put a little bit of jazz gospel in there. Empty oh. space in the, in the mass, and my director says this, and so i got to play something. Make it up. Improv. Spanish Gregorian chain. Exactly. <laughs> what? Oh, long story. There's an ad for a Spanish musician who plays the organ, but Gregorian chant is the primary music of the church. But the musician should be Spanish speaking. Yeah. Okay. So I've asked her to arrange a mariachi version of you know, some Gregorian for us. But play it in the organ. Yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, we have a Spanish version of Holy, Holy, Holy. Santo, Santo, Santo. We sing a Jamaican song today. Jamaican. It's a Hale, Hale, Hale. Oh, yeah. But it's like always Jamaican. It's a Marty Hagen thing, isn't it? I think it's a Marty Hagen thing. Trust Marty Hagen to do reggae. <laughs> what did you say? I'm sorry. I said trust Marty Hagen to do reggae. Yeah. <laughs> Marty Hagen was the was was one person that a former colleague of mine couldn't stand. So when we were doing more of that kind of music, I just brought them out all the time <laughs> <laughs> because the obstacle is the path. <laughs> yeah. What else is creative? I like designing. You know, programs, enrichment programs for my mm -hmm. pretty, pretty uh, mean with a roll of duct tape too. 
Yeah, no doubt. We are going to put speed bumps in the labyrinth because the obstacle is the path. Do you know me? <laughs> Why would yeah, you do right. such a thing? That's just cruel. Well, we're going to put mats down, too. <laughs> you know, is, is the ability to solve problems creativity? Yeah, I was just going to say, well, you're reading all these wonderful spreadsheets that accomplish a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is accounting much easier? Is accounting ever easy? When you make the right kind of spreadsheets. Okay. <laughs> That's my problem. I can't math. That's okay, you can't math. What about relaxing? Yes. That is creative. Unless you don't feel that you can. What'd you say? That you can't relax. You can't relax? No. I'm right there with you. That first obstacle is saying that you can't. Why not? I might fall asleep and miss everything. What if um, our biggest barrier falls back on that side where we believe that we're starting below ground trying to dig our way out? And so people like us don't. People like me don't. I should be doing something productive. As if, and then, I'm as guilty of this as anybody, but as if sitting there and, and just relaxing and so decreasing your stress level and having your blood pressure drop and having your cortisol level drop isn't productive. I mean, what now? I said that I've been super productive lately. Yeah, you've only been productive in producing the stress of the course. Well, yeah, yeah, you're trying to eliminate that, not get it. Not I found creative outlets. <laughs> the, the point is that we've been convinced that spirituality and, and the divine or the universe or God or whatever you want to call it has been captured by institutions locked away in buildings, and can't be found anywhere. Despite the fact that the, every tradition pretty much, all the major traditions pretty much say that whatever God is, that energy, that creative energy was present in the beginning. And is from, it is from that that everything comes. It is from that that we have our origin. So why in the world would there be anything wrong with looking for the divine or the transcendent or truth in places where you never have before. How do you know it's not there if you haven't checked it out? And, and even more radically maybe, and why I really like this notion of, of see, I actually like divinization, um, that term, but whatever we come from, that energy, that beginning, either in our own lives or on a much grander scale, whatever we come from, surely that's what we return to at some point. And, and so why can't we acknowledge that just in the living of life, just in learning to express ourselves in different ways, just in learning to be fully human, we in fact become fully divine. I forget who said it, but it's profound, so I'll say it without, and somebody may know. But somebody said, God created humanity so humanity could become God. That's... Maybe Athanasius? Could have been. Echinacea? Yeah. <laughs> no, Saint I didn't John's know what you said. Athan <laughs> Athanasius. Oh, okay. Athanasius. okay, it might have been. And that's what's behind this notion, that this quote from Psalm 82, which Jesus quoted this verse in one of the Gospels. I tell you, you are gods. That's reason enough to walk away from these views of ourselves that are punitive and restrictive and, in fact, life-denying. And to start exploring possibilities and not feel badly about it. Because I believe in doing that, we're doing what we're here to do.
even if it happens to occur between the ends. Amen. The nice and the naughty. Nice and then